Welcome again this evening to the second of our Burke's Lectures. My name is still Ian Henderson, um, and the interim hasn't been that short, so I'm still the, the interim dean. Um, so let me welcome you back again, those of you who were here yesterday and have come back. Um, if any of you are here for the first time, also welcome and thank you for being with us. The Burke's Lectures are the Faculty of Religious Studies most prestigious um, invitational lectureship. Um, it's offered each year by a distinguished scholar in some subfield of religious studies. This year, uh, it was the turn of the biblical area, uh, and so I'm doubly happy uh, to be welcoming you. Let me also especially uh, welcome those of you who've come from our sister universities. It's uh, great to see you, students and, and faculty. Thank you for being with us. Let me now ask my colleague, Professor Kirkpatrick, Patricia Kirkpatrick, to uh, reintroduce our guest speaker to us this evening. Thank you. John J. Collins is the Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale Divinity School. But that we know, right? Because we've all looked him up. He's noted, however, for many different things, and I will only touch on a few because you haven't come here to listen to me, you've come here to listen to him. He's noted for his research in the Hebrew Bible, and this includes a very fine introductory text, now in its second edition, which uses all of the resources of the internet as an interactive text. And I brought this along with me, John, because I, I um, this is the first edition from uh, Abraham Malamat in his uh, Isra early Israelite warfare and the conquest of Canaan, because I wanted to know in this interactive text, which is actually pretty fantastic, um, uh, I think that it'll take me at least 10 years to get through it, uh, but uh, what I wanted to know was whether or not there was any gaming that was on that interactive text that actually would allow my students to game ahead <laughs> with the warfare. I'm trying to do that later. Seems to me it's a good investment. <laughs> as well as the apocryphal works of the Second Temple period, including the sectarian works found in Dead Sea Scrolls and their relation to Christian origins, there are among over 300 scholarly works which Collins has published and edited. But arguably his best known works are between Athens and Jerusalem, Jewish identity and the Hellenistic diaspora, something of which we were listening to a bit yesterday in a revamped version as we listened to his thoughts on ethnos and particularly as they related to, to the term Judeus. This he published in 1983, and it was followed then by many other articles, uh, but most notably then, a, text, uh, a commentary on the book of Daniel and one of the most prestigious commentary series of Hermeneia, uh, a text a commentary on Daniel which is still a required text for anyone studying with me in Biblical Aramaic and Daniel. The Scepter and the Star of the Messiahs of the Dead Sea Scrolls and Other Ancient Literature in 1995, and again many books in between, and then the Bible after Babel Historical Criticism in a Postmodern Age in the year 2005. Even the dullest of minds could tell from these titles and would recognize the encyclopedic nature of Professor Collins' scholarly reach, ones which he shares with great passion and with a wonderful generosity. A native of Ireland, from where the best of things originate, <laughs> Collins was educated at University College in Dublin and also at that other place, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the McGill of the South, he has held academic positions at a number of institutions, including the University of Notre Dame, Harvard University, and the University of Chicago. He has served, oh, he has served, as president of the Chicago Society of Biblical Research, and then as the president of the Society of Biblical Literature in 2002, not arguably, but actually the largest society in the world. He has also served as editor-in-chief of Dead, the Dead Sea Discoveries, supplements to the Journal of the Study of Judaism, and, of course, the Journal of Biblical Literature. 
Personally, I was strangely comforted yesterday when listening to the first lecture of the series entitled Torah and Jewish Identity in Second Temple Judaism to hear you reference the scholars of my youth who informed so much of what I learned then, namely Elias Bickerman, Alexander Fuchs, and of course Victor Cherikov, much of whose work was not translated from the Hebrew, still is not translated from the Hebrew, and still therefore not accessible to undergraduates and graduates. Comforted to know that there is still the scholarly convention of acknowledging the chain of scholarly thought, even if now we would recalibrate much of what they had to say. But we are fortunate, for now, for the generations of the students that I have taught, there was, and still very much is, John J. Collins, who I ask you to welcome with me once again to the podium as he delivers the second of two Burke's lectures entitled Mosaic Forms of Judaism in the Second Temple. I actually have a slightly embarrassing admission to make with regard to the textbook and it's the interactive part of it. That the interactive website thing was done by the publisher. And I have only the vaguest idea of what they put in it. This is a whole, uh, how would you say, a growth on the textbook. <laughs> and, uh, I don't vouch for it. Anyway. What I want to talk about tonight, well, let me back up for a moment. The, the gist of my argument yesterday is that by at least the Hellenistic period, but I would say already the Persian period, there was the recognition of the Torah of Moses as the official formulation of the way of life of the people of Judah, whatever we call them. Uh, now, that much, this did not necessarily mean that everybody in Judah was reading it in great detail. For most people, what this meant was that there were certain uh, observances associated with the law of Moses that were regarded as boundary markers. And these included, for example, circumcision, the Sabbath, the festivals, and uh, even though many people might be literate and might know too much about what was in the book of Leviticus, nonetheless they had now this deference to the law of Moses which was regarded as normative in some way. Now, I use the word normative uh, with some hesitation because in the, the, the time that I have been active in the field, the idea of normative Judaism took a beating. Uh, the phrase normative Judaism was coined by George Foote Moore, great scholar at Harvard back in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, what Moore meant by that was essentially the rabbinic writings. Now, he recognized that the rabbinic writings were later than the, what I'm calling the late Second Temple period or the New Testament period. But as Seth Schwartz put it, Moore's reading of that material was teleologically rabbinotropic. <laughs> Is that the nice way it's uh, now, <laughs> meaning that his view was, you know, that it was tending to the perfection that it would reach in the rabbinic corpus. Now, that whole idea was attacked vigorously by a man named Jacob Neusner, who uh, was prolific to the point that you would say, I haven't published anything. He had at one time 200 titles. And that was early in his career, probably, yes. Uh, but in any case, he advocated the idea that we shouldn't even speak about Judaism in this period, we should speak about Judaisms. And what is a Judaism? A Judaism, for a user, is a single religious system. It is composed of three elements, a worldview, a way of life, and a social group 
but in the here and now embodies the whole. The worldview explains the life of the group, ordinarily referring to God's creation, the revelation of the Torah, the goal and end of the group's life at the end time. The way of life defines what is special about the life of the group and the social group in a single place and time, then forms the living witness and testimony to the system as a whole. Now, uh, what I would say about that, first of all, I think the argument that we should speak of Judaisms in the plural is surely backwards. Because if Judaism in the singular doesn't have a clear meaning, there is no way Judaisms in the plural can mean anything. You know, that the meaning of the plural is, is derived, uh, obviously, from the, the singular. And um, uh, Jonathan Smith, who was an ally of, um, uh, of Neusner, uh, argued, you know, for the, the variety of Judaism, saying that even when they professed and uh, had the same practices like circumcision, they understood them differently. And Seth Schwartz, who may refer to a number of times, teaches at Columbia, uh, declares with some justification that that is precisely wrong. Uh, the same evidence that Smith uses for plural Judaisms could be used to argue for a prevalence of a common Judaism, meaning that even people who disagreed on what it meant still did the same things. So it's as much an argument for the unity as, as not. But really, the point that I want to pick up on from that whole debate is that Neusner, while he thought he was championing variety, still could not conceive of a form of Judaism that wasn't centered on the Torah. So that when he was describing a Judaism, he says, well, it has a worldview, and normally the Torah. And what I want to raise tonight is whether there were not, in fact, some forms of Judaism in the Second Temple period that were not centered on the Torah. And that, I think, would bespeak a much greater degree of variety than what Neusner was willing to acknowledge. Now, I intend to discuss here three cases, and there are others that could be discussed. But the first one has to do with the Persian period, and the, uh, this is the time before Ezra. The second one with the early wisdom literature. And the third one with the literature associated with Enoch. So first of all, then the early Persian period. According to Nehemiah chapter 8, when the people came to study the words of the Torah with Ezra on the second day of the seventh month, they found it written that they should live in booths during the festival of the seventh month. This is the festival of Sukkot. The remarkable thing about this account, though, is that no one in Jerusalem seems to have been aware of such a law until they found it written in the book. It's the surprise that's, re that's registered. The, mission of, the whole mission of Ezra is predicated on the fact that the book of the Torah was not known in Jerusalem before he arrived. This impression cannot be dismissed as the tendency of Ezra and Nehemiah. It is confirmed by the prophetic writings of the Restoration period. As David Carr has remarked, post-exilic prophetic traditions in the latter part of Isaiah and in Haggai and Zechariah, along with the Nehemiah memoir, lack the kind of Torah focus seen in later texts. Haggai is entirely preoccupied with the issue of rebuilding the temple, with a brief appendix on the restoration of the monarchy. When he wants a ruling on, or a Torah, as he calls it, on a purity issue, he refers the issue to the priests, not to a book. He says, you know, go ask the priests. He does not say, go check in your book of the Torah. Uh, there is a reference to the Torah in Zechariah 7.12, but this is part of the redactional frame of Zechariah's visions, and the visions themselves never refer to it. The last chapter, ten chapters of the book of Isaiah never really mention the Torah at all. These texts do, of course, touch on issues that are also treated in the Torah, and when they do, there's a tendency in scholarship to assume that they are engaging in exegesis. For example, 
Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 to 7, takes a position contradictory to Deuteronomy 23 on the question of who may be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Several scholars have argued that these texts, together with Ezekiel 44, verses 6 to 9, constitute an exegetical chain. In the words of Joachim Schauper, what we have in Ezekiel 44 and Isaiah 56 are two interpretations of Deuteronomy 23 that are mutually exclusive. But as Christoph Nehan has pointed out, the passages in Deuteronomy 23 and Isaiah 56 do not share a single term in common. It is difficult then to say that Isaiah 56 is an interpretation of Deuteronomy. Moreover, as Michael Fishbane, who was the, the man, you might say, who invented inner biblical exegesis, uh, certainly who popularized the idea, but even he already acknowledged Isaiah 56 is not presented as an interpretation of anything. It is, it is presented as an oracle of God, and the same is true of Ezekiel chapter 44. The issue of admission to the assembly was evidently disputed. And the post-exilic prophets may well have known Deuteronomy 23, but my point is they did not treat it as authoritative scripture so that their own views would have to be presented as interpretations. Isaiah 56 does not appeal to the Torah of Moses as such. It does, however, appeal to the covenant. Eunuchs and foreigners may be admitted to the house of the Lord if they keep the Sabbath Choose the things that please me, and hold fast to the covenant. Beyond the observance of the Sabbath, the requirements of the covenant are not specified. Joe Blankensop comments that in contrast to the priestly prescriptions of the Pentateuch, Sabbath observance and not circumcision is here the criterion of membership in the community. It is possible, of course, that circumcision is entailed in keeping the covenant. And the covenant is presumably the Mosaic covenant, so the Judaism of Trito Isaiah is not strictly non Mosaic, but it does not appeal to the Torah, to the book of the Torah. Uh, and this is notable and it lends support to the view that the Torah was not the basis for Judean identity in the early Restoration period before the coming of Ezra. Another example of a Judean community in the Second Temple period that is not regulated by the Torah of Moses is provided by the Judean garrison at Elephantina in Upper Egypt. This community is known from a cache of Aramaic papyri that spanned the 5th century BCE, so it's Persian period again. It had its own temple in honor of Yahu the traditional god of Israel, who had been, which had been built before Cambyses came to Egypt, that is to say before 525. And there sacrifices and offerings were made until it was eventually burnt down by the local Egyptians. But the garrison also apparently contributed funds to the cults of other Aramean deities, Anath Bethel and Eshem Bethel, there were nearby Aramean temples to Bethel and the Queen of Heaven. Moreover, uh, and both of these, we have reason to think, were worshipped also by Judeans at some point. Moreover, Judeans at Elephantina swore oaths by several other deities, including Anna Yahu, whose name is reminiscent of pre-exilic inscriptions that mention Yahweh and his Asherah. As many scholars now believe, Yahweh had a wife before the Babylonian exile. While there are several items that relate to cultic matters, there are no copies of the Torah or any part of it, and the correspondence does not refer to the Torah. The authors refer to themselves as Yehudayah, Judeans or Judahites, even though there are indications that their ancestors came from the region of Bethel, which was historically in the kingdom of Israel. When their temple was burnt down, they appealed to the authorities in Samaria and Jerusalem, apparently unaware of the restriction of sacrificial worship to one place in Deuteronomy chapter 12. 
There are references to distinctively Israelite or Judean practices such as Passover, unleavened bread, and Sabbath, though not circumcision. And Andre Lemaire has argued that Judean ethnicity of Elephantina was mainly apparent as marked by religion and ritual. But there is nothing to indicate that these Judeans had in their possession a copy of the Torah of Moses. They had the Behistun inscription, and they had the words of Akika, but they didn't have the Torah of Moses. Neither did they betray any awareness of the patriarchs, Moses, David, or even despite the observance of the Passover, the story of the Exodus. Now, of course, we may not have the whole story, and they may have been familiar with those things, but the extant papyri don't mention them. Um, so now, they, there is one interesting document found at Elephantina called the Passover Papyrus. It's a bit of a misnomer because it doesn't actually mention the Passover, but it mentions, it describes as the festival of unleavened bread. It's a letter sent by one Hananiah to my brothers Jedaniah and his colleagues, the Judean garrison, transmitting an instruction allegedly sent by the king to Arsenes, the governor of Egypt. Now you thus count 14 days of Nisan, from the 15th to the 21st. Be pure and take heed. Any work do not do. Do not drink. Anything of leaven do not eat. Sunset until the 21st day of Nisan. Bring the leaven into your chambers and seal it up during these days. Uh, there were several lacunae in that, by the way. It's not actually saying do not drink anything. It probably said do not drink anything fermented. We do not know for sure who this Hananiah was, but he was evidently a person of some importance. Nehemiah had a brother, Hanani, and it is possible that this is the same person, although we can't verify that. Nehemiah also mentions a Hananiah who was a commander of the citadel. Another text from Elephantina speaks of trouble with local Egyptians since the time that Hananiah came to Egypt. It is unlikely that the instructions of the observance of unleavened bread were sent on the initiative of the Persian king, who presumably didn't care whether they ate unleavened bread or not. Uh, but presumably, the Persian official signed off on the initiative of some Judeans who were trying to impose standard observance on outlying communities. We might suppose that this was a consequence of the attempts of Ezra and Nehemiah to impose the Torah in Judah. Porton went so far as to claim that the letter of Hananiah would have been written under the impact of the canonization of the Torah, but that, I think, is clearly uh, anachronistic. The view that Hananiah was bringing the provisions of the Torah to Elephantina encounters some anomalies. First, there's no reference in the papyrus to the law of Moses. The authority that is invoked is that of the Persian king. Second, the extant text doesn't actually mention the Passover. It only deals with unleavened bread. Neither does it specify whether Passover and Matzot should be celebrated together or whether the Passover should be celebrated in the temple or in the family. Reinhard Kratz infers that the papyrus shows no awareness of Deuteronomy 16 or Exodus 12. Some of the provisions are not found in the Torah, and others were later prohibited, such as sealing up leaven in chambers. There are two ostrich Belfantina that mention Passover, and they make no reference to unleavened bread. Kratz concludes that while the papyrus deals with a matter that is discussed in the Torah, it is not based on the stipulations of the Torah. But I think that conclusion is open to question. The references to the 14th and 15th days of the month seem to reflect Leviticus chapter 23. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at twilight, there shall be a Passover offering to the Lord, and on the 15th day of the same month is the festival of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. In fact, I would argue that the major purpose of the letter was to communicate the correct dates of Passover and Metzot in accordance with the priestly legislation. 
It is remarkable, however, that the papyrus does not invoke the authority of the Torah or cite its specifications exactly. And all I can say about that is, to make a copy of the Torah was expensive. And I would say the people in Jerusalem either couldn't afford to or were too cheap to make a copy to send off to the boonies in Elephantina. And so they said it's enough if you get them to do it on the right days. Kratz makes a similar argument in the case of the Sabbath. We find reference to the Sabbath on Ostraca, but Judean Elephantina engaged in trade and transportation and stocked warehouses on the Sabbath. Kratz comments in this respect, they were no different from the Judeans or the people of Tyre who are condemned or, or denounced in the book of Nehemiah. Julius Wellhausen deemed the Judeans of Elephantina to be a strange vestige of pre-legal Hebraism and a fossil remnant of not yet reformed Judaism in a distant land. Most scholars have agreed whether they trace these Judeans to the northern or southern kingdom. Kratz, however, argues that they do not just represent an earlier form of the religion of pre-exilic Israel or pre-exilic Judah, and, but suggests that even in their own time they were not exceptional. Rather, they seem to have been compatible with the Jewry represented by the leading figures in Jerusalem and Samaria to whom they address their letters. He infers that the Torah of Moses did not play an important part, role yet in the Persian provinces of Yehud and Samaria. It is not apparent, however, that the leading figures in Judah and Samaria regard them as regard the people in Elephantine as entirely compatible. When the temple was burnt down, the Judeans appealed to the governor of Judah and the high priest, but to no avail. Three years later, they appealed again to, the, to Bagohi and to the sons of the governor of Samaria. They replied, not by letter, but by an oral communication recorded in a memorandum, let it be an instruction to you in Egypt to say to our cities about the altar house of the God of heaven, to rebuild it in its place as it was before, that they may offer meal offering and incense upon the altar, as was formerly done. The high priest is not cited in the reply, and they noticeably omit any reference to animal sacrifices. A subsequent petition of RCB specifically promised that no animal sacrifices would be offered in the restored temple. That compromise may have been necessary to appease the priests of the god Knum, who was a ram god. And some people think that the Egyptians may have been offended, that the worshippers of Knum may, be have, may have been offended by the sacrifice of a lamb at Passover. But it may also have been required by the authorities in Jerusalem, who were not keen on having people offering sacrifices down in Elephantine or anywhere outside of Jerusalem. Whatever the authorities in Jerusalem may have thought of the Judeans of Elephantine, the latter may not have been as greatly at odds with the situation in Judah as they might initially seem. What the books of Ezra and Nehemiah show, taken at face value, is first that the Torah was virtually unknown in Judah before the coming of Ezra, and second that the reforms of Ezra were ephemeral. We find Nehemiah, who is usually dated some 13 years after Ezra, fighting with people who persisted in marrying non-Judeans. According to Nehemiah 13, verse 25, I contended with them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. <laughs> this does not necessarily show that the Torah was unknown in Nehemiah's time, but that many Judeans, including some of the high priestly family, didn't feel any obligation to let it regulate their behavior. We do not, of course, know how the people berated by Nehemiah would have identified themselves, but they were presumably Judeans or Judahites. The people at Elephantine who celebrated the Passover do not even refer to the common Israelite Judean myth of origin in the Exodus and the papyri. Papyri may not give us the full picture, but they show that it was possible to be Judean or to be Yehudayah in the 5th century without reference 
to the Torah of Moses. My second case, then, is the wisdom tradition. The Judeans of Elephantina were not focused on or even aware of the Torah of Moses, but at least they celebrated the Passover and observed the Sabbath. The early wisdom books now included in the Bible do not refer to distinctive Israelite or Judean traditions at all. In the words of James Crenshaw, the existence of a body of literature that reflects specific interests at variance with the heuristic texts in general seems to argue strongly for a professional class of sages in Israel. Within Proverbs, Job, and Ecclesiastes, one looks in vain for the dominant themes of the heuristic thought. The exodus from Egypt, the election of Israel, the Davidic covenant, the Mosaic legislation, the patriarchal narratives, the divine control of history, the movement toward the glorious moment when right will triumph. Instead, one encounters in these three books a different world of thought, one that stands apart so impressively that some scholars have deemed that literary corpus as an alien body within the Bible. David Carr argues plausibly that the absence of Torah in this material is due to the fact that it originated before the Torah attained its central importance. In the beginning, he writes, there were various forms of textual wisdom in which Torah is either not reflected at all or is reflected in very subtle ways. Just as Mesopotamian and Egyptian educational systems began with proverbs, instructions, and hymns as their foundational texts, it is likely that Israel likewise started with some of the texts we now see in Proverbs and Psalms, these texts serving as foundational texts for the rest of the curriculum. At least in the case of Koheleth, we have to assume that an independent wisdom tradition with no explicit acknowledgement of the Torah persisted into the Hellenistic period. That changed in the second century BCE when Ben Sira famously declared uh, that, the book of the, that all wisdom is the book of the covenant of the Most High God, the law that Moses commanded us. By this time, the Torah was incorporated into the educational curriculum of the sages as an important source of wisdom. The association of wisdom and Torah is also attested in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Even for to instruction in the scrolls, which does not thematize Torah, doesn't actually cite it explicitly, clearly draws on it. It should be said that, in, that Ben Sira uses the Torah as a source of wisdom rather than as a source of law, but he clearly subscribes to the view that the Torah of Moses has iconic status, such as, as, as an expression of the traditional Judean way of life. By iconic status, I mean that everybody kind of bowed to it and acknowledged it, even if they never read it. It has that kind of status for many people to this day. <laughs> Some scholars find the fusion of wisdom and Torah already in the later stages of the Book of Proverbs. Bernd Schipper, who, who teaches in Berlin, notes the echoes of Deuteronomy in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 to 23. Keep, my son, your father's mitzvot. Forsake not your mother's Torah. Bind them always upon your heart. Tie them about your neck. When you walk about, it will guide you. When you lie down, it will watch over you. When you wake up, it will converse with you. For the mitzvah is a lamp, and the Torah is a light, and disciplinary reproof is a way of life. Similar echoes of Deuteronomy can be found in the wisdom instructions in Proverbs 3 and 7. The three wisdom instructions, says Shipper, share a number of terms like Torah, mitzvot, and the injunction to bind the Torah upon the heart, to inscribe it on the tablet of the heart, or tie them about your neck. These and other observations support the view that Proverbs is alluding to Deuteronomy. Schipper concludes that the crucial point is that by this intertextual allusion, the mitzvot of the father and the Torah of the mother comes close to the Torah and mitzvot of God. 
Even if they appear in the text strategy of Proverbs as parental instruction, this instruction refers to the will of Yahweh. Wisdom, says Shepherd, has become a hermeneutic of Torah, and he even claims that Proverbs 6 prioritizes Torah over wisdom. Similarly, Stuart Weeks argues that Proverbs is trying to assert some kind of connection between proper instruction and the law. But in fact, Proverbs refers neither to the Torah of Moses nor to the Torah of Yahweh, but to the teaching and instructions of the parents or of the sage in loco parentis. As Michael Fox has noted, the terms Torah and Mitzvah in Proverbs consist of authoritative injunctions, not suggestions or recommendations, but do not refer to law or legally enforceable ordinances. It is authoritative teaching, but its authority derives from human teachers, not from divine law given on Sinai. Insofar as Proverbs uses language derived from Deuteronomy, this means, says Fox, only the terms of honor learned from one book are used in the other. It is noteworthy that the sages were familiar with Deuteronomy, but they do not invoke it as divine revelation. Rather, they claim for their own Torah or teaching what Deuteronomy claims for itself. No doubt in rabbinic times, or perhaps even in the period of the scrolls, the use of words like Torah and mitzvah would evoke the Torah of Moses. But this was not necessarily the case in the circles in which Proverbs was composed. The relation of Koheleth to the Torah has also been a matter of controversy. Many scholars see an allusion to Genesis 2-3 in Koheleth 3.20, all go to one place, all are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Or to Deuteronomy 23, 22 to 24, in Kohelet 5, which warns that one should fulfill a vow without delay. But while Kohelet made no Genesis in Deuteronomy, he hardly treats them as Torah or acknowledges them as authoritative. As Bernie Levinson has commented, when Kohelet 5, 3 to 4 cites Deuteronomy's law of vows, it does not do so because of the authority of Scripture as much as because of the laws reasonableness. As Stuart Weeks has commented, until the closing verses of the book of Koheleth, uh, in, uh, of the book, I should say, Koheleth shows no obvious interest in the Torah at all. The main controversy about Koheleth's attitude to the Torah concerns the epilogue in Koheleth 12, 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of everyone. Most scholars regard the epilogue as a corrective coda added by an editor, not as a summary of the sage's teaching. Even Michael Fox, who argues that it was part of the original composition, sees the epilogue as an attempt to win acceptance from the book by a gesture towards conventional piety. It is true that this epilogue does not contradict the sayings of Koheleth, since he never disparages the keeping of commandments. Yet, as Leon Siav has noted, it puts a different spin on Kohelet's work by associating the fear of God with keeping the commandments. In the words of Stuart Weeks, to fear and obey God is to act in a way that characterizes almost any ancient piety, but the specific formulation here, keep his commandments, is so quintessentially deuteronomic but it could hardly have been read by early Jewish readers. It could hardly but have been read, ex uh, except as a reference to the Torah. And the author of these verses must surely have been aware of these connotations. Although Kohelet might allow the possibility of divine communication and commands, it is very doubtful that his thought had any place for the concept of a Torah or its many implications. The late Gerald Shepherd argued that the epilogue finds its closest parallels in Ben Sira and is therefore a secondary addition to the book. In, con in contrast, Thomas Kruger argues that one can also interpret verse 13 as a purely pragmatic recommendation to all people in daily life to hold undogmatically to the religious and cultural norms that they find in their particular living environment. 
In that case, however, it would no longer bespeak a Torah-centered piety at all. The wisdom tradition, at least before Ben Sira, is not an attempt to formulate Judean identity. We simply do not know whether the sages and their students were circumcised and kept the Passover. It would be hasty to infer that they did not. Nonetheless, it is significant that a whole area of instruction in the Second Temple period could proceed without reference to the Torah. The Torah was not the only possible framework for teaching the fear of the Lord. Crenshaw is surely right that the canonical wisdom books exhibit a worldview that is quite different from that of the Torah, and as such represent a different construal of Judaism from what we find in Maccabees, or even in the wisdom literature from the second century BCE on. Now the final example that I will discuss is the case of the early literature in the name of Enoch. Gabriele Bacchini has argued at length that the books of Enoch attest to a tradition that extended over centuries, possibly beginning as early as the fourth century BCE and extending it to the first century of the Common Era. He recognized that this was a complex and dynamic trend of thought and therefore cannot be fitted entirely into a unitary scheme or a universal definition. Yet its generative idea, he said, can be identified in a particular conception of evil, understood as an autonomous reality, antecedent to humanity's ability to choose, the result of a contamination that has spoiled human nature, an evil that was produced before the beginning of history. And in that, he is following his teacher, Paolo Saki. He associates this tradition with a movement of descent within the priesthood, reflected in strong interest in the calendar, and a statement in the animal apocalypse that all the offerings in the post-exilic temple were polluted and impure. According to Boccaccini, writings preserved in First Enoch were the constitutive documents of this tradition, but not the only ones. He finds the same conception of evil in some books in which the figure of Enoch was not central, such as Jubilees and the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, or was even missing in the case of Fourth Ezra. He also argues that this Enoch tradition was, in fact, the early Essene movement. Now, Bacchini's wider claims that go beyond the actual books of Enoch and identify e Enochic Judaism with early Essenism have been widely criticized by myself, among others, and need not detain us here. The further Enoch of Judaism is extended beyond books in the name of Enoch, the more problematic it becomes. The writings that make up first Enoch, however, are closely bound together by recurring motifs and allusions, and several of them envision a distinct group of righteous within Israel. The Book of the Watchers in first Enoch 1 to 36 refers to a plant of righteousness and truth. In the Apocalypse of Weeks in 1st Enoch 93, the elect are the chosen righteous from the chosen plant of righteousness. The animal apocalypse speaks of lambs whose eyes are open. Even the similitudes of Enoch, which are later in date than any other part of 1st Enoch by at least a century, seem to envision the righteous as a community. It is not unreasonable then to suppose that these books of Enoch were composed within a movement of some sort, although continuity is hard to demonstrate in the case of the similitudes, and even more so in the case of Second Enoch, which is later still. For the present, however, I want to focus on the earliest components of the collection, the Book of the Watchers, the Astronomical Book, the Apocalypse of Weeks, and the Animal Apocalypse. This corpus has some distinctive features. One is the prominence of the story of the Watchers, developed from the enigmatic account of the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, which seems to provide a distinctive explanation for the prevalence of evil in the world. Another is the degree of interest in otherworldly geography. These features of First Enoch are distinctive, even in the context of the apocalyptic literature as exemplified by the book of Daniel. Moreover, the negative reference to the temple in the animal apocalypse 
implies a rupture with what was arguably the most central symbol in Judaism at the time. The most obvious and basic distinguishing trait of this literature, however, is the fact that Enoch is the mediator of Revelation rather than Moses or any other figure drawn from Israelite tradition. This in turn raises the question of the status of the Mosaic Sinaitic revelation in these books. Was this group Enochic in the sense that it looked on the legendary patriarch as the primary mediator of revelation? Or was the invocation of the antediluvian hero merely a literary device in books that were solidly grounded in the Mosaic covenant? Scholarship in this issue has, in fact, been rather evenly divided. On the one hand, George Nicholsburg, who has written by far the best commentary on the books of Enoch, has argued that Enochic wisdom was an alternative to the Mosaic Torah. On the other hand, E.P. Sanders and Mark Elliott have viewed it as an, exam as an example of covenantal gnomism. The division of opinion is most acute in the case of the early Enochic Book of the Watchers. At the core of this book is the story of the fallen angels in Genesis chapter 6. To, in Genesis chapter 6. This is usually regarded as a midrash on the story of the sons of God in Genesis 6. Although J.T. Millick famously argued that the Enochic story was older than the variant in Genesis. The account of Enoch's ascent to heaven has various points of contact with prophetic traditions, in his subsequent tour with an angelic guide, he has shown the holy mountain at the center of the earth, which is evidently Mount Zion, and beside it a cursed valley, presumably Gehenna. He also sees the garden of righteousness and the tree of wisdom, from which your father of old and your mother of old who were before you ate and learned wisdom. And their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they were driven from the garden. Moreover, the opening chapters of the Book of the Watchers are a virtual tissue of biblical allusions, and Lars Hartmann has argued that they find their referential background in covenant renewal ceremonies. It is widely recognized that the story of the Watchers weaves together two distinct strands, in one of which Shemi Haza is the leader of the fallen angels, while in the other the leader is Asae. Now, uh, much of the Book of the Watchers clearly depends on what we know as the biblical text. This is not to say, however, that it is exegetical in intent or that it presupposes the authority of the Mosaic Torah. James Coogan, who more than any other scholar has made the case for the exegetical character of the Pseudepigrapha, grants that first Enoch may well have passed on traditions originally unrelated to the biblical text. There is, to be sure, an exegetical element in the story. In the Book of the Watchers, the flood is clearly the consequence of the sins initiated by the sons of God, while that connection is not explicit in Genesis. But there is no biblical basis at all for the stories of Asael and Shemi Haza, the leaders of the fallen angels. The ascent of Enoch and his tour of the extremities of the earth are spun off from the biblical statement that he walked with God, or walked with Elohim, which was probably understood as angels. But many of the details of these chapters, such as the geography or the discussion of the chambers of the dead, have no basis in the biblical tradition. The chosen righteous from the chosen plant of righteousness, or the elect group envisioned in first Enoch, understood themselves as descendants of Abraham, the chosen plant of righteousness. In the animal apocalypse and the apocalypse of weeks, it is quite clear that they're an offshoot of historic Israel. Yet, as Nicholsburg has observed, the only explicit reference to the Sinai covenant appears in the apocalypse of weeks, which says that a covenant for all generations and a tabernacle will be made in the fourth week. The animal apocalypse, in contrast, which clearly knows the story of the Exodus, refers to the ascent of Moses on Mount Sinai, uh, but conspicuously fails to mention either the making of a covenant or the giving of the law. At no point is there any polemic against the Mosaic Torah, but it is never the explicit frame of reference. 
In this respect, the Enoch literature stands in striking contrast to the Book of Jubilees, which retells the stories of Genesis from a distinctly mosaic perspective with explicit halakhic interests. In Jubilees, the patriarchs observe the Torah. And for that reason, I think you can't say that it would be anachronistic if Enoch referred to it. He could have referred to it if he wanted to. He could have foreseen it. The revelation of to, to Enoch is prior to that of Moses and in no way subordinated to it. As Lickelsberg has argued, the general category of covenant was not important to these authors. To quote Nicholsburg again, in short, the heart of the religion juxtaposes election, revealed wisdom, and the right and wrong ways to respond to this wisdom, and God's rewards and punishments for this conduct. Although the components of covenantal gnomism are present in this scheme, the word covenant rarely appears, and Enoch takes the place of Moses. In addition, the presentation of this religion is dominated by a notion of revelation, the claim that the books of Enoch are the embodiment of God's wisdom, which was received in primordial times and is being revealed in the eschaton to God's chosen ones. The understanding of the relationship between the elect and God may be covenantal in the sense that it's based on laws that entail reward and punishment, but it is not based on the Mosaic covenant which was so widely accepted as the foundation of Jewish religion in the Hellenistic period. It is often argued that the reason the first Enoch is not specifically mosaic is simply a reflection of its pseudepigraphic setting in the pre-Diluvian period. But the choice of pseudonym and setting is not incidental. By choosing to attribute the vital revelation to a figure who lived long before Moses, long before the emergence of Israel as a people, the authors of the Enoch literature chose to identify the core revelation and the criteria for judgment with creation or the order of nature as they understood it, rather than with anything distinctively mosaic. Discussion of Enochic Judaism suffers from the fact that the Enochic books provide no account of a social organization or of the rituals that the chosen righteous observed. We can only discuss word view and any inferences about the social location of the authors are hazardous. They're often thought to be priests who were alienated from the Jerusalem temple. The clearest, clearest evidence of alienation is the criticism in the animal apocalypse, the criticism of the cult. The Book of Watchers describes the heavenly abode as having an outer court, a central chamber, and an inner chamber, or holy of holies, like the earthly temple. The Apocalypse Weeks envisions an eschatological temple. Uh, and it has been suggested that the story of the fallen angels who took human wives was an allegory for priests who ventured into forbidden marriages. Martha Himmelfarb notes that the fit is not exact. Angels, after all, were not supposed to marry at all. Nonetheless, she accepts the suggestion and suggests that the Book of the Watchers believes that priests should marry only women from priestly families. But that actually is a stretch. You know, that's going well beyond what the book actually says. She also claims that the Book of the Watchers depicts Enoch as a priest because he's cast in the role of intercessor for the fallen angels who should be interceding for him. But in fact, Enoch is never called a priest in the Book of Watchers, although he is in later tradition. But rather, he is called a righteous scribe. If the story of the Watchers implies a criticism of priests at all, the point would be that the priesthood has failed and non priestly scribes are needed to intervene. What you need is that a priest but a lawyer. <laughs> uh, while it is clear enough that the people who produced the early Enoch literature were not associated with the Jerusalem temple, it is not at all clear that there were dissident priests or engaged in a sustained polemic against the Jerusalem priesthood. The authors were evidently familiar with at least parts of what we know as the Torah. Uh, for, for example, the Apocalypse of uh, the Book of the Watchers evidently knows at least parts of Genesis and so forth. Uh, the most ex extensive engagement with the history of Israel is found in the later apocalypses, which date to the time around the Maccabean Revolt. 
Andreas Badenbender speaks of the fundamental change that Enochic Judaism underwent in consequence of the Maccabean uprising. He also regards the prefatory chapters in first Enoch 1 to 5 uh, as a mosaicism of the Book of the Watchers. As in the case of the wisdom literature, we appear to have a tradition that was not originally concerned with the Torah of Moses, but that eventually integrated it into its repertoire. After the Maccabean rebellion, it was much more difficult to say you were Judean without referring to the Torah of Moses, although you still have a few who do. Uh, even in the later stages of the tradition, however, the Enoch literature never requires the kind of halakhic interest that we find in Jubilees or the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Torah plays no significant role in the similitudes of Enoch, which are usually dated to the first century of the Common Era. Like the earlier Enoch books, the similitudes speak of the righteous and chosen rather than of Israel, and their primary opponents are the kings and the mighty. The similitudes are not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they may testify to the persistence of a form of Judaism that was not focused on the Torah of Moses into the first century of the Common Era. But if the similitudes do attest to a non mosaic form of Judaism, they're exceptional in the post Maccabean era. Judaism was not necessarily more unified in the period after the revolt. But the divisions that existed centered on differing interpretations of the Torah. That is shown most clearly by 4QMMT, literally, some of the works of the law, which list several halakhic issues as the reason for sectarian separation. Both the Pharisees and the sectarian movement known from the scrolls had as their raison d'etre the exact interpretation of the law. It is perhaps ironic that the great symbol of Jewish unity, the Torah, should also be the generator of sectarian division. Much the same could be said for the temple, the other great unifying symbol of Jewish life, which was also the occasion of bitter division. The temple was eventually destroyed, but the Torah has endured. Are written in the law of Moses and they weren't written there at all. We're still doing it today. 
and they still do it today, and Christians do it with the Bible too. You know, but he says, that's what I mean by this a kind of iconic status. But that's not the point when you start referring to it. But, you know, they, in uh, Babylonia, they just really didn't have an equivalent to the Torah. Not, none of those Babylonian law codes ever functioned the way the Torah does eventually. But that's not the question. The question is, how did it function earlier? How did it function earlier? Well, you know, I think my, my strongest argument for it, that it wasn't known in Jerusalem and I don't mean now that it didn't exist, because I think it did exist in Babylon. But it wasn't known in Jerusalem. That's the whole presupposition of the story of Ezra, that when he comes along, everybody is shocked. You mean there's a festival we're supposed to go out and cut branches? OK, let's go. You know, but it, it all comes out of the blue. Yes, I have a question. It was what I believe you said last night, so I apologize for that. But what you said in light of Second Temple Judaism, um, you mentioned one particular person who being you thought was a radical Jew by the name of Paul of Tarsus. By the name of? Paul of Tarsus. Oh, yes. Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so I, I was expecting you to say Daniel Boyard. I wonder what word you used for another Jew by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. That's a good question. Uh, but, you know, Jesus of Nazareth was not as radical as Paul. No. I think Jesus of Nazareth was quite happy to continue to live as a Jew. Yes. Now, how he understood his Judaism, this is an enormously controversial issue, and I can only refer you to the first four volumes of John P. Myers treatment of the historical Jesus. And he has a very good treatment of that whole question of the law in book four. Amy Gilbert Bean has helped me understand that a bit. Yeah, but you know, it, it does not seem to me that, that he had any interest in discarding the law. That yeah. what Jesus did was say that it's the spirit, the spirit of the law is more important than the letter. Yes. But now, a good rabbi could say that. Whereas Paul is a different matter. Okay, I'm more interested in the one from that. <laughs> uh, behind the, the, yes, this one. Yeah, yourself, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, you suggested, uh, to oversimplify a uh, rich paper, but you suggested that the combination of sort of geographic isolation and the lateness of the uh, Maccabean period allowed the peripheral areas to practice various other forms of non mosaic Judaism. Mm -hmm. Yet, despite the, the fall of the Second Temple and even more isolation and division, none of these other variants continued to exist. Instead, I mean, there, were, there, was, there were lots of arguments about all kinds of things, but the arguments tend to focus on the Mosaic Code and how it should be applied. Yeah. So it, it, there seems to be something wrong here if the same factors which allowed for variation to begin with don't seem to operate later on. What's wrong is that something had happened in between. And that something was the Maccabean Revolt and the rise of a Jewish kingdom ruled by the Hasmoneans. Yeah, but that, and that, I but think, that wasn't without controversy in itself. True, true. But they had the power to enforce things. Only for a while. Only for a while, because, but for but about half a year. And, and for a crucial period in the first century, uh, when the, the Pharisees, when, when they let the Pharisees do it, and it's in that period that you get the insistence that of a great concern with purity that you see in the big fold and the stone vessels and which you don't find any archaeological evidence for at the earlier time. So, you know, by the time of the destruction of the temple by the Romans, the Torah had a status and there was an established way of interpreting it that hadn't been the case at all before the Maccabees. That's what happened. Okay, but wouldn't you say nonetheless 
that considering the dispersal of the Jewish population throughout the Mediterranean world anyway, yeah. would have encouraged a great deal more variation than actually did. Well, and, uh, you know, I am not at all sure that it didn't, but I am not, uh, for, for one thing, you know, we, we don't have very good records. We have rec good records for the community in Egypt down until the beginning of the second century. And after that, we have nothing except the rabbinic literature, really. Uh, so we don't know how Jews in Rome were living in the second century. We don't know how Jews up around the Black Sea were living. But, you know, when you do find evidence of them later on, you find a great deal of variety, actually. You know, you'll find Jews practicing magic, which they weren't supposed to do. And, uh, you, you know, I mean, to this day, you will find communities who have quite distinctive practices. You will find some who are highly secularized. And you will find some who are highly ritualized. Uh, so, you know, I, my guess is that a lot of that variety went on. But the trouble is that after the Jewish revolts, the only record we have is the rabbinic literature. So, yes. Yes, uh, thanks again for a lot of food for thought. And I don't know whether I'm fully convinced on, on quite a lot of stuff. Um, for example, it's very difficult always to do an argument from silence because you have to basically say, well, the author of the Book of Watchers, this is his intent, and therefore, if he'd known this stuff, he would have surely used it. Um, I guess, for example, the Book of Watchers, I see one of the purposes is partly answering the problem of evil. Yeah. When, as monotheism grows on, there seems to be uh, a theological crisis in the Persian period. You get the Book of Job, we also have sort of, you know, prosperous, sinful, rich people, yeah. and there's the righteous core, and it's sort of, you know, it's sort of, things are a little topsy-turvy. Why follow the Torah or God's laws yeah. if that's the case, you're just going to shale? So, you could say it sort of presupposes a sort of scenario where there is sort of some sort of understanding of, of Torah, of sort of reward and punishment for doing certain things. Uh, no, wait a minute. Here. Well, like, wait just, a minute. Just okay, get a slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. An awareness of reward and punishment for doing certain things yeah. does not equal okay. the Torah. Yeah. You get that also yeah, yeah, in the Torah, right. but yeah, you exactly. don't have to have the Torah to get that. But then you, you have to sort of so. No stolen yeah, cases. If the purpose here. is to introduce <laughs> the idea of the uh, judgment of the dead. Yeah. As, as an answer to the problem of yeah. is it yeah. is because of God's justice. Yeah. It may be difficult to say, okay, well, to assign it this te new teaching to Moses, because it's like, you're going to have to say, well, it's some sort of hidden treatment. So where could we, we we'll pick Enoch, you know, I mean, it's sort of, this is a very sort yeah. of, think of these people but trying you know, to, you know, but it's... You know, uh, other people had no trouble ascribing yeah. it to Moses. That's true. Well, and, and, and is it, they, yeah. they don't cite texts directly from Moses, but they'll yeah. attribute it to the prophets. But he's sort of a convenient figure with this sort of a, to yeah. him, you know, sort of, you know. You know, um, I mean, my counterpoint in There's a way... There's not much mentioned about him. Perhaps recently Daniel was chosen later on. Yeah. The book of Daniel, you know, sort of give yeah. authority to it. Now, but you see, Daniel doesn't offer anything like as comprehensive mm -hmm. a teaching as Enoch does. Mm -hmm. So nobody would say that there was such a thing as Danielic Judaism. Well, exactly. Yeah. You know, Daniel was just the prophet. Mm -hmm. And as soon though, you know, actually you don't get much reference to the Torah in, in the first half of Daniel especially. But I, I don't think anybody doubts that the second half of Daniel is presupposing uh, the Torah. When you say but, the Torah, you mean just the first five books? I mean, yes, the yeah. books of Moses. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah. And it's the books of Moses as construed through the lens of Deuteronomy. Because it's Deuteronomy that's first called the Torah. Yes. You know, Genesis isn't, doesn't refer to itself as the Torah, neither does Exodus, actually. You know, it's through the lens, it's when Deuteronomy gets tacked on to it that it becomes the Torah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the distribution of the Torah was not all that great. Yeah. Um, and think about times when Jesus 
he criticized the uh, Pharisees. You know, have you not read in the scriptures this? Have you not read in the scriptures that? Were the Pharisees at Jesus' time, perhaps also Paul's time, were they that uh, literate on the uh, Torah at that time, or was it still a, a book that was only for part of them and some of them really didn't know it? Well, you know, the, the case where we now have the best evidence is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And assuming that, that, that those were preserved by the Essenes, there you had a community that was highly literate. Now, that was probably a novelty of the Hellenistic period. Uh, the Pharisees emphasized oral tradition, but you figure they knew all the details of the Torah, whether they were getting it orally or, or in copies. Uh, there is a recent book by a man named Michael Sattler, who teaches at Brown University, How the Bible Became Holy. And he pushes, I think maybe to an extreme, the idea that hardly anybody could read for a lot of this period. And that just because you have all these laws in Leviticus doesn't mean that anybody other than a couple of scribes knew about them. Now, as I say, I think he's pushing that to an extreme, but at the same time, there's something there to be pushed. You know, it's an exaggeration of, uh, of something that has some validity to it. Uh, but I do think that by the time of Jesus, say, uh, the Pharisees knew their stuff, the Essenes knew their stuff, and then people would have a big debate as to how well Jesus knew his stuff. Because there's no doubt that he's presented as knowing it, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but uh, whether, whether, you know, how much of that you attribute to Matthew and how much of it you attribute to Jesus is the problem there. Yes? Yes. And um, the thought that there was an issue with Jews marrying non-Jews. So I've been doing research on Joseph and Essenus, and um, Chestnut makes the claim that the purpose of that book is to say that conversion is genuine, and so it's okay for Jews to marry non-Jews. Yeah. So I'm curious, is there a connection between Joseph and Essenus and the Egyptian Jews at Elephantina? Uh, I can safely say absolutely no, because the Jews of Elephantine were wiped out as far as, you know, they disappeared from history, about 400 BC. Joseph and Nazareth, depending on where, when you date it, I would date it probably in the early first century BC. Uh, Ross Kramer would date it a Christian book in the fifth or sixth century, but I, mean, uh, I don't think that's very likely. But it's not earlier than, say, 100 BC. So there's several hundred years in between. Now, the, you know, the, the issue of intermarriage doesn't come up at all in Elephantina, where it comes up is in Jerusalem when Ezra comes and finds out that people are marrying foreign women. But Joseph and Nazareth would be an anti Ezra book. It's taking a different position. It's saying you can marry a Gentile woman so long as she can marry. Am I allowed to ask a second question? Oh, there's one. There's one. Okay. Is there anybody else with the first question? Yes. I'm going to try and frame this question as best as I can. Um, you mentioned that there are scholars like E.P. Saunders and Mark Elliott who consider not within the range of continental moments. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Um, well, we didn't actually say that, but I think uh, you could say it, probably. Um, now, you know, inclusive of what? You see, 
would they, assuming that there was an Enochian community, would they have accepted anybody who wasn't, in some sense, Jewish? We don't know. We really don't know. Uh, they had no theological grounds for refusing such people. I think they thought of themselves as descendants to the land of Abraham. So it's inclusive in that sense. But my guess is that in fact it was a fairly small group and that, that this wasn't that big an issue for them. You, know. uh, you could say the same thing in Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of the time when they talk about being sons of light, do sons of light have to be Jews? Well, actually, yes, they do, but they don't put that in the, in the theoretical statement. They just assume that. So the, the, the problem, and to answer your question, is that we just don't know enough of what these people would have believed in practice. But I think as far as their theology went, you would be right that they should have had uh, an inclusive monotheism. How are we doing? One more. Okay. We have two people actually want to each ask a second question, so we'll take the two of them. One yes. of yes. In the light of what you've said, um, how can you regard the authority of scripture uh, or the biblical tradition, or would you give it any authority at all? <laughs> oh, I'd give it some authority. <laughs> but uh, I would give it the authority of tradition. Let it happen. And you know, scripture now. is part of tradition. Yeah. It's part that I think some Anglicans would probably feel comfortable enough with that. <laughs> uh, some other Protestants would not. Uh, but I see it just as part of the tradition and the down to us. Yeah. And you know, it's like uh, Karen Newsom, the teachers at Emory says that the Bible is like a southern family history. There are things in it you wish weren't. <laughs> but it's your history. <laughs> you know, so you learn something about yourself from reading it. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with it all. It doesn't mean you approve of it all. Yeah. You know, it's like my father drunk or sober. Yeah. I remember in the book I read the misunderstood you by Amy D. Levine. Yeah. She said in many ways the Christians are quite all wrong as far as Jesus is concerned. And um, so that's part of my background for my question. Okay. And you accept the authority of Amy J. Well, I find it very I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Last question. Okay, I'm just uh, wondering what when do you see sort of the age of the law codes, the various different law codes we find in the Torah? When do you think they perhaps first associated with Moses? And when do you think they reflected the word of God, etc.? I think the first, I, the first person to promulgate the idea that Moses received a law on Mount Sinai is the person we call the Elohist. <laughs> now, I should hasten to add that about half the people who work on the Pentateuch, or maybe more, don't believe there ever was an Elohist. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, <laughs> but in any case, what I mean is that the, it's that block of laws in the book of Exodus. Now, if you believe in the source critics, then the Yahweh didn't have a law given on Mount Sinai. Um, in the priestly code, all, Moses, told, all uh, Moses was told on Mount Sinai was how to build the tabernacle. And all the other laws would flow from that. So it's the Elohist, and who the hell was the Elohist? And that we wish we knew. But I would figure that he was somebody who was influenced by the prophets, who comes towards the end of the northern monarchy, probably in the eighth century. And now the laws as you get them in Exodus are not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. Deuteronomy, and I do believe that the core of Deuteronomy comes from the time of Josiah, I, that I think was an attempt to make it into a comprehensive thing that could be made to stand against the Assyrian loyalty oaths. 
I saw this morning the announcement of a book challenging that, which I haven't read yet and I would have to read, but I'm not going to agree with the critic. <laughs> so, and, you know, so that, I think, gave you the core of the law. When they sat down in Babylon, I think you had the, then people trying to reconcile the fact that they had different traditions. The priests then had their own law code. And what was patched together into the law that Ezra brought back was a compromised document. And I think this was because the Persians said, you can live by your own law, but you just have to agree on what it is. <coughs> and the easiest way to agree is put it all in. Put in both accounts. And let the lawyers worry about it as you're on. There you go. <laughs> uh, that, I will wrap it up, yeah. Thank you, John. Well, um, I know that we could go on, at least here we could go on for another half hour. Um, thank you so very much. I know that you're probably going to be publishing this soon, so we'll all keep an eye out for it. Uh, as to the many questions that have uh, come up here, uh, they don't come up unless what it is that they engage with is engaging. And I thank you for presenting such a complex issue in ways that were, yes, accessible to everyone here. And so please join me in thanking Professor. Thank